It's really bad. Page 129. Keep in mind that God is not causing any of the persecution, falling away, or tribulation. Evil men will do that. You know? God wants his children to prevail, persevere, and make it to the end. What if they don't? Again, what if a Christian does not make it to the end? You know, if I ever get into an actual conversation with Dr. Hoven, that's one of my questions for him. Are Christians sealed under the day of redemption? Yes. What if they take the mark? Not a problem for me. I'm dispensational. I rightly divide the word of truth. But somebody like Ken Hoven, who's been led astray by Roland Rasmussen and other false prophets that are non-dispensational, it's a big problem for them. They can't handle it. But again, keep in mind that God is not causing any of the persecution. Uh, you know, falling away or tribulation, evil men will do that. Uh, the Antichrist is unleashed by Jesus Christ himself. Whew. Let's continue. Page 130. He did not promise to save us from tribulation. Actually, he said, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Again, the, ter the title tribulation is not in the Bible. It's a description, not a title. The rapture takes place after the sun and moon go dark in verse 12. Revelation 7 verses 9 through 17 tells more about this great multitude who came out of the great out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay? Uh, I don't recall Christians having to wash their robes. Um, we are washed. I'm not washing my robe. I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. I don't have a robe that I have to wash. That's works. Faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. Faith in Jesus Christ, and you can't take the mark of the beast. You have to endure to the end to be saved. And it would be endurance, too, by the way. Not being able to buy or sell. I mean, it would be difficult. But uh, page 131. Many of today's Christians expect a life of, of ease and a pre-trib rapture. Again, this is one of the lies total lie of the whole post-trib, pre-wrath crowd or post-trib or mid-trib. Anybody that believes they're going into any part of the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week, they all say, you just are taking it easy. Let me answer that with a very two little pointed questions here. Okay. Let's just assume for a hypothetical case here for the sake of argument. Tomorrow, okay, or today, we'll say today, at some predetermined time, God speaks to the entire body of Christ audibly. The lost world can't hear it, but he speaks to the entire body of Christ and he says, I am coming back exactly one year from today, this very hour. The rapture. One year from today. Question. How are you going to spend your year? If you knew for sure God spoke to you, he confirmed it somehow, you know, confirmed it to all the Christians out there. You call each other up. Man, did you hear it? I heard it. I heard it. What would you do with your year? Knowing that the pre-trib rapture is going to happen in one year. What would you do? Keep that in mind. Now, the same situation happens, only this time God says, body of Christ, in exactly one year, I'm going to unleash the Antichrist and he's going to sign the peace treaty and the time of Jacob's trouble is going to start. What would you do with that year? Which one would lead to more complacency? Well, you wouldn't be complacent, I can't say that. You'd be very busy storing up food, trying to survive the time that's coming, knowing that you aren't going to be able to buy or sell. Wouldn't you? You talk about prepper. You'd put those lost preppers to shame. And rightfully so, hey, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, that we're to provide for our own men like myself. I'm to provide for my family. So why would I spend my last year going out and being militant for winning souls and stuff and not prepare for this time knowing I'm going to be going into it? See? You see? But what if you knew that Jesus Christ was coming back a year from today and we're leaving? Do you think you'd care about prepping? Do you think you'd be more bold in your witnessing? Yes. So which theory really makes you more complacent and really makes you more at ease? Hey, if you believe that you're going into the time of Jacob's trouble, 
you got at least seven years yet before you see Jesus. That's plenty of time to clean things up. But what if you believe that the return of the Lord, the catching away of the bride of Christ, could happen at any minute? Are you going to look at pornography on your computer there? Are you going to watch TV shows that you know you shouldn't watch? Are you going to listen to the wrong kind of music? Knowing that Jesus could come like that? No. The pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away is a purifying hope. Again, I've talked about that. It doesn't make you complacent. But let's continue. Page 131. Jesus warned us it would come. He want, wants us to endure. And here he quotes it. But it says, the same shall be saved. I don't have to endure the end of anything to be saved. And trying to put that on a Christian today is preaching a false gospel. You better be very careful who you listen to, Dr. Hoven. Page 134, Daniel 9, 27, midst of the week there, Jesus spoke of this verse, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, who so readeth, let him understand. Ken Hoden read it, and he didn't understand. <laughs> okay, what's the holy place for a Christian? Again, I talked about that. Your body's the holy place, the temple of the Holy Ghost. We do not have a holy place, in spite of what some of the Baptists think with their holy temples that they build. Church buildings in the New Testament, there is no such thing as a church building. The church is the people, never a building. Again, I can't get into that. I've talked about that in other studies. Page 137. Before he wrote his second letter, he must have gotten word that someone had written them a letter falsely using his name and saying that the day of Christ, rapture, it's not the rapture, it's the day of the Lord, the day of Christ could come any second. Paul set the, that straight in no uncertain terms. Um, no, uh, he didn't actually set the thing straight that the rapture couldn't happen at any time. That's not true. Because uh, it can. Page 138. Paul made it very clear in 2 Thessalonians 2.3 that the Lord cannot come until two things happen first. A falling away, we are in that right now, and the man of sin be revealed. Again, I talked about that. I already disproved it. Okay, the man of sin being revealed is that being let right now. That can't happen until the body of Christ is gone, until the body of Christ has been removed. And Ken Hoven will not even discuss that. That's the interesting thing. I believe uh, his persecution of the Jews was Satan's trial run for the end time events coming up soon, including the three and a half years of Great Tribulation. Hitler's method of getting Germans to hate and then kill the Jews should be studied carefully. I agree. I agree totally. The Hitler was a trial run for the coming Antichrist. But yet it's funny because Steven Anderson is now using Nazi propagation, propaganda films, uh, the Jews and their lies, you know, and Martin Luther's satanic book attacking the Jews. And, you know, he's coming out. He's into this whole system right here, Steven Anderson. And he's coming out and he's using Nazi, Nazi techniques, using the same words, using clips from the Nazi propaganda film. I mean, you know. That's why I've been warning about this whole thing. Page 139. The next page here, it says, First, he didn't just start killing Jews one day. It came on gradually, like I suspect the persecution of Christians will be in the end times. What about the persecution of Jews? That's what's really coming. Hitler started quietly pushing for his ultimate solution, the extermination of all Jews, early in his reign. The same people that put Hitler in power, the Roman Catholics, are in power today, and they're planning it again for the Jews, not for Christians. Okay, I'm not saying that Catholics don't hate Christians and would love to kill Christians. Of course they would. But the real persecution is, come to the Jewish, is coming to the Jewish people. Hitler blamed Germany's problems on the Jews and offered a solution. Just like Steven Anderson is doing today. Page 141. After Hitler spread propaganda about the Jews being the cause of Germany's problems, he began villainizing them as subhuman. Laws were passed in Germany to slowly squeeze the Jews out of jobs, teaching positions, and government. The movement that Anderson is part of right now, Stephen Anderson. The orders gave explicit directions on how to per perpetrate the events of what was to come, or what has come to be known as the Kristallnacht, Night of Broken Glass. Homes and businesses were destroyed and looted. Synagogues were set aflame, and Jews were beaten and killed, exactly as Martin Luther said to do in The Jews and Their Lies. And actually, Anderson puts that clip into his movie, Marching to Zion, puts the, the quote from uh, 
Martin Luther, and then he makes an Arabic version. Uh, and, and instead of calling it the Jews and their lies, he, or instead of calling it marching to Zion, he calls it the Jews and their lies. You know, so he's calling for the same thing. Stephen Anderson is. He's a wicked false prophet. Persecution of the Jews intensified quickly after a crystal knocked, and the rest is history. Over 6 million Jews, 11 to 17 million total Jews and non-Jews, were killed in various ways. This time it will be 100 million, Daniel, and then he gives the scriptures. Right there, again, Anderson denies that. And Stephen Anderson is a Holocaust denier. Like I said, Ken Hoven, you really need to be careful who you are yoking up with. Page 144. Power is given to him to continue 40 and 2 months. That's uh, 3 and a half or 1260 days. The last half of the 7 years. Okay. Talking about the Antichrist. And... Uh, of course, the Antichrist is going to be there for the entire time, but uh, you know he really gets bad halfway through. That's when he sets himself up in the temple. Okay, it says here down a little bit farther: the day of the Lord has two parts: a time of wrath and then a long time of blessing, as Jesus rules on the throne of David from Jerusalem. Uh, not true. Again, the the early part when the day of the Lord happens, when Jesus Christ comes back, yes, there's a time of wrath, but it's not almost three years. All right, it doesn't cut way into the Millennial Kingdom. The Bible is crystal clear that when Jesus Christ comes down and he, he after the judgment of the nations, they rule and reign with him for a thousand years, not, not 997. Again, Ken Hoven's been led astray there. Page 146, Satan will use that to fool Christians. Uh, the thing of the new versions using in, not on, or on, not in, excuse me. Uh, Satan will use that to fool Christians. It sounds awful that God would allow Satan to have dominion over the saints for three and a half years, but that's what the Bible says. History shows he has done it before, and God has not really uh, good reasons for doing it this way, but he also has great rewards for those willing to die for him. Okay, and again, the question comes up to Dr. Hovind, what if a Christian takes the mark? It's a problem. Page 147. Antichrist acts act of defiance against God and idolatry is a sign that the second half of Daniel's 70th week is beginning. You can count off the 1260 days until the Lord returns from that day. Interesting, because I didn't think we were supposed to know the time. Some will object and say, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Obviously, Jesus said this while he was on earth and had set aside some of his heavenly powers during his earthly stay. Once he rose from the dead and ascended back to heaven, things changed. He certainly knows the day and hour now. Um, see how he avoid the, avoided the issue right here? You know, yeah, the verse is talking about Jesus there, but it's also talking about no man knows the day or the hour. But according to Ken Hoven, you can know the day or the hour. And he actually gives the, you know, he predicts 2028. But down here he says, According to Rasmussen, the word tribulation is from the Greek word, oh boy, here we go. Rasmussen and Rosenthal both, you know, resort to going to the Greek because they can't hang, handle the English. Um, Rasmussen, I, or Rosenthal, actually, I saw in the book earlier, I was reading a bit of it, and he actually says that uh, where it says, um, the, the 24 elders where they say, hast redeemed us, us to God by thy blood, uh, he says, actually, the Greek word us there could also be translated them, has redeemed them to God by thy blood. So let's see, it's, it's not actually us, the 24 elders, it's them, people down on the earth. <laughs> Whenever you need to resort to Greek, and you can twist the Greek texts, you know, there's over 40 different Greek texts out there, many of them with, with many different multiple editions of them. The Nestle's text has 28 editions right now, so people start going to Greek you can make Greek say anything. There are lexicons out there. Uh, uh, Thayer, uh, Thayer's lexicon. Thayer was a Unitarian. What even a saved man? And he's telling you definitions of Greek words. I mean, the whole Greek thing, nonsense. But whenever a guy has to start going to Greek to try and change the text of the King James Bible while claiming to be King James only, you know you're dealing with a wolf. Page 149. One of the biggest mistakes people make in the discussion about the timing of the rapture is not distinguishing between tribulation and wrath. Tribulation is what the world does to us, and wrath is what God does to the world. 
last three and a half years is the Great Tribulation, not the time of wrath. Absolute, total lie. Absolutely, totally a lie. It's never called the Great Tribulation, as I've been saying. Again, Ken Hovind has been lied to, and he keeps repeating these lies over and over and over and over again. The Holy Spirit is not behind this. Okay? There are many parts of this that are true, where he talks about creation science, you know, right on the money. He's absolutely right. But when he starts getting into this other stuff, he's, he's just repeating what Rasmussen mind-controlled him to say. And, and, you know, it's very, very bad. Page 151. Many, 100 million plus, have been killed and many have fallen away. Uh-oh. Um, so what happened to the ones that fell away? Again, problem. The other nations like America, the plucked eagle, still harbor some safe havens for them. Antichrist's kingdom is primarily powerful in the Middle East and has less authority elsewhere. Huh? What? Down here, Jesus told us to endure. No, he did not. He told Jews. They're going to have to endure to the end to be saved. Why? They rejected Jesus Christ. If you're Jewish, you can get out before this time starts. But if you say, no, I don't believe in Jesus. He's not going to be my Messiah and whatever else. I'm looking for another. You're going to get the other. And then you're going to realize, uh-oh, yeah, it should have been Jesus. And then you're going to have to endure to the end to be saved. Get out now while it's easy. Actually, there are two distinct parts to his second coming, as we will see. It's kind of funny because people try to say, oh, there's just one second coming, not two, and everything else. But this pre-wrath rapture stuff, they have Jesus coming into the clouds and then him coming back down with his saints, but they just get the timing really mixed up. And they just get so mixed up, they never really get it right. Um, there's no secret coming found in the Bible. Yes, there is. There an angel blows a trumpet. See? See, I blends it all together. First Thessalonians 4, Matthew 24, Mark 13. Uh, okay, it's, it's a, not an angel that blows a trumpet. In First Thessalonians 4, 17, it's the trump of God. You see the problem? And any Christians who survive the Great Tribulation are called up or gathered together in an event commonly called the Rapture. Absolute nonsense. That time is not for us. It's not called the Great Tribulation. It's called the time of... Uh, Jacob's Trouble, Daniel's 70th week. See, it's just like I'm showing you this stuff to show you how he repeats the lie over and over and over and over again. Why? Because I think that that's what they did to Ken Hovind while he was in prison. Just repeating this lie over and over again. That means the falling away where many followers leave Jesus comes during the seven-year tribulation. The rapture is post-trib but pre-wrath. No, it is not. And again, what do you do when a Christian falls away if we supposedly go into that time? God needs us here on earth during this terrible time to be a witness for him and to get more souls saved. <sighs> the two witnesses appear in Revelation 11. Moses and Elijah. And it is Moses and Elijah. We're going to see that later. That uh, He doesn't believe in that either. He's been led astray again. It's Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses. And then you have the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. They are also witnesses. The Lord does not need you here, Christian, into the time there and, and risk you losing your salvation. And God comes out as a liar because he said you're sealed under the day of redemption. Uh, let's continue. Page 159. Don't confuse the day of Christ with the day of the Lord as many do. Uh, well, actually, that is the truth. The day of Christ and the day of the Lord are one and the same. Okay? And look what he does. It's interesting that every single chapter of both First and Second Thessalonians talks about the coming of Christ. And he gives you a bunch of things to look up here. And look at this. Second Thessalonians 1, 8 through 10, 2, 1 through 3, jump to verse 8 through 9. Whoa, wait a second. What happened to verses 4 through 7? Don't read those verses because it debunks this whole system of pre-wrath post-trib. Page 160. By far the major doctrine uh, pre-tribbers cling to is, or to for support for their position is the idea that Jesus could come at any moment. Uh, this is called the doctrine of imminency. Pre-tribbers argue there is nothing that needs to happen before Jesus comes back Jesus, since Jesus told his disciples to watch, be ready, those aren't for Christians, wait for his coming, 
and look for the blessed hope. Okay? These are for Christians. Those are for Jews. He's not rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? Does eminency support the pre-trib rapture teaching? It would if it were true, but it is not. Oh, uh, yes, it is. Paul said clearly that the day of Christ cannot come until, here we go again, see, repeating the lie again, there's a great falling away, and the man of sin is revealed, stops at verse 3, keeps doing that, the man of sin is revealed in the middle of the seven week, years, no he isn't, he's at the first, when he breaks his treaty, and sets up his abomination that maketh desolate. Not true. Daniel 9.27 is he's confirming the covenant. That's at the beginning. When the first seal is opened. Uh, it's wearying reading this, you know. Down here a little bit farther. Peter's epistles could not teach eminency. Well, much of Peter's epistles are appointed to people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Since Peter wrote his last letter in about 67 AD, and any other New Testament books written before that time, like the four Gospels, Acts, the writings of Paul and James, could not teach eminency either, or there would be a conflict. No, it's called rightly dividing the word of truth. There are conflicts unless you rightly divide. The whole New Testament is not written to Christians. We are just a tiny little bit there, the church age. Now, it is a lot of years, I'll grant you that. But the point is, God's plan is for the nation of Israel. We get in because they rejected Jesus Christ temporarily. As much as I wish the rapture was imminent, and as hard as I believed it for 40 years after all the clues say he is not coming until certain things are fulfilled, why are you stopping at verse 3? That's dishonesty. Paul did not teach eminency. Yes, he did. Paul was in Jerusalem causing a riot when the Lord told him to be of good cheer since he would get to testify of Jesus in Rome. Jesus could not have returned until Paul made it to Rome. This is a dumb way of reasoning. Paul could be calm on the storm-tossed ship since he knew he would make it to Rome. He, has, he had the Lord's promise. The return of Christ was not imminent. Well, you know, that's ridiculous. I mean, what a, what a dumb argument. Uh, Jesus comes and he says, Paul, you're going to go to Rome. Um, okay. Paul says, all right, well, I'm going to be there. But he's still expecting the Lord to return. You know? I mean, if the Lord... I mean, do you really think that, that... You know, let me say it this way. If the Lord says to me, hey, I want you to do a sermon on such and such. I'd like you to do that sermon. Do I really think that I'm so important that the Lord's got to wait for me to get my sermon done before he makes things happen and catches his bride away? Of course not. But let's continue. I'm going to show you there's a really bad one here. The Lord told the Apostle John on the island of Patmos that he would prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings, Revelation 10, 11. So he did not... Look at this. This is crazy. So he did not expect the imminent return of Christ. He knew he had to get off the island and do all these things before the Lord returned. John did not believe in imminency. Okay, let's continue. Since Revelation is the last book written for the New Testament, 96 AD, and it could not teach in imminency, there's no way any other book in the New Testament could either. Okay, as Roland Rasmussen says, Revelation 10:11 does to the pre-tribulation doctrine of imminency what the atomic bomb did to Hiroshima. Page 283. Um, well, there, Dr. Rasputin, I mean, oh, excuse me, Rasmussen, um, to say that shows complete ignorance of Scripture. Why? Where was John at when he was told that in Revelation 10? He was in heaven, having experienced the rapture in Revelation chapter 4, before the time of Jacob's trouble started. Rasmussen's nuts. And unfortunately, Ken Hoven is listening to the guy. I would love nothing more than for the Lord to rapture us all out of here today. I have looked for and longed for and waited for that day of blessed hope since I first learned about the Lord's second coming in 1969. It's not his second coming. Second coming is at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? The catching away of the bride of Christ is not the second coming. Again, rightly divide. Page 162. Down further on the page here. Many pre-tribbers will lose faith and fall away thinking the Lord forgot them or broke his promise. Nonsense. God never promised to save us from tribulation. Actually, he promised we would have that. 
He did promise to save us from wrath. Well, then we're going to be leaving before his judgment begins, before he unleashes the Antichrist. In Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. The order of events on the day of Christ. After the tribulation, he goes into the whole thing again here, which includes the opening of the first five seals. The sixth seal is opened, Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. Okay. Again, the mistake that a lot of these people make is they say, Revelation, the events of Revelation chapter 6 happen, and then... It kind of goes on. The books of Revelation are not chronological. You say, I don't believe it. Well, let me show you. In case you haven't seen that pre-trib rapture moment that I did on this subject. Oops. Here we go. Okay. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7. Uh, da, 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 verse 2 saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying hurt not the earth okay till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads hurt not the earth Revelation chapter 6 down through here and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places the earth is destroyed over here. This is the second coming. Revelation chapter 6 is a synopsis of the entire time of Jacob's trouble, from beginning, Antichrist being unleashed, to the end, Jesus Christ's second coming. Revelation chapter 6 covers the whole thing. Okay? Then it goes back in and starts to get into more detail of what happens with it. All right? Revelation chapter 6 doesn't happen, and then Revelation 7 starts. How do you know? Because in Revelation 7, the angel says, Don't hurt the earth. Why would he say that if the earth has already been destroyed with the events of Revelation chapter 6? The Antichrist, war, famine, death, hell, you know, great earthquake, islands and everything's moved out of their places. Angel comes down, hey, don't hurt the earth in Revelation 7. They're not chronological. Again, Ken Hovind makes that mistake because he's been led astray by false prophets. Okay, here we have... There's a shout and the voice of the archangel, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. There's a trumpet blast. That's our cue to look up and lift up our heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. This one up here is not an angel playing the trumpet. It's the trump of God. This one down here is an angel playing the trumpet. It's not the same thing. That one. Trump of God, angel. Two totally different things. Next page, page 165. Meanwhile, down on earth, the unsaved people are mourning the fact that they missed the Lord's coming and 144,000 Jews get converted when they look on him whom they have pierced, or whom they pierced. Nonsense. They get converted too late for the rapture, but they now join the two witnesses who have probably been trying to teach and preach to them, but their hearts were hard and eyes were blinded. Um, okay, so when did these two witnesses show up? The Bible is very you know, clear in Revelation chapter 11 that they're preaching and prophesying for three and a half years. So when do they show up? Well, no time is given. And the 144,000 Jews get sealed for the last just little 1,040 days or whatever it is. So God's not dealing with the nation of Israel uh, until the very end. The rest of the time it's for the church because the church needs to be purified even though the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. But we got to be purified by going through God's judgment and wrath. See how stupid this system is? Page 166. There's a great controversy raging in the church today over exactly what happens to those rejected at the judgment seat. But one theory says those who were foolish, slothful, or not watching servants are temporarily rejected and cast out to outer darkness with the unbelievers. Those foolish, slothful servants do not lose their eternal life. Uh, in heaven to come 1,000 years later, but do lose the entrance into the wedding and apparently into the 1,000-year kingdom. I can't make the pieces fit any other way. Okay? Um, absolute, retarded, ridiculous nonsense. And again, Ken Hoven did not get this from reading the Bible. He got this from a guy named Joey Faust. Joey Faust, essentially, they call it the Baptist purgatory. <laughs> a lot of people will make fun of him with that. The Baptist purgatory. That's what it is. Uh, the the you know he's a Baptist, um, you know 
part of the body of Christ goes into the millennial kingdom. The other part burns in hell for the thousand years. So if you're a carnal, lukewarm Christian, you burn down there till you're purified. That's purgatory. It's what Catholics teach. Okay? It's just stupid. Absolutely stupid. I mean, there's no nice way for me to put it. It's stupid. You know, that half the body of Christ is on earth ruling and reigning with Christ and, and they go through the marriage, but it, the, those naughty Christians that, that kind of messed up, they're in hell burning. Sure. Down here a little bit further, it says the 144,000 Jewish converts are sealed to protect them from the wrath of God. Uh, no, they're not. <laughs> uh, that's, that's stupid. As mentioned before, God needs his children here on earth during the tribulation to win souls. No, he does not. He's sending the two witnesses. He's sending the 144,000. He does not need the body of Christ here. Uh, it's a long study, okay? I understand it's a long study, but, you know... There's going to be a lot of stuff in this that we have to cover. Let's continue. Page 172, Titus 2.13, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. There are many great truths in that verse. We see that Jesus is God. We see that His appearing is not a secret coming as some teach. How do you get that out of there? Um, it is the day of the Lord that comes as a thief in the night, not the day of Christ. The day of the Lord and the day of Christ are the same. It is important to use an infallible Bible and to rightly divide the word of truth. <laughs> uh, <sighs> I'm getting tired. <laughs> rightly divide the word of truth. Let's just blend the Gospels and Pauline epistles and everything together. Make it all try to fit together and, and we're rightly dividing the word of truth by doing such. Further down on the page, 172. The Bible clearly teaches the day of Christ when he appears is the end. This would mean the preacher of rapture teaching is wrong. Jesus comes for his bride at the end of the 70th week. No, he does not, as I've been saying and proved over and over again. Since 2009, when I announced my switch back to the historic position of the church, lie, uh, i.e. post-trib rapture, or post-trib rather than pre-trib rapture, I've had several godly brothers tell me the passages I cite in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 are for the Jews and do not apply to Christians. They all still believe in the pre-trib pre rapture. I'll work on that. I don't think so. Brothers, I must strongly disagree. Now look at this. These, those three parallel passages, passages, are, passages are for Christians, not Jews, and do apply to us today. Jesus was warning his disciples what was coming so they would not be surprised when it came. <sighs> Matthew chapter 24. Again, I've talked about this in other studies. I mean, just read, people. <laughs> it's like you can debunk this stuff. It's so easy. It's, just, it's, it's so sad that Ken Hoven has fallen for such lies of these false prophets. I mean, good night. Okay, first of all, what did we see earlier from Hebrews chapter 9? The death of the testator, death of the testator brings in, excuse me, the New Testament. Okay, Matthew 24 is before Jesus died on the cross. We are doctrinally in the Old Testament, therefore. Okay, but let's look at this thing. Here we have Matthew chapter 24. Let's look down here. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. That's not anything for us today. We don't have to endure to the end to be saved. Look at this. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Look and show me anywhere in the Pauline epistles where we have the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, we are not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. All right? That's for the Jews who, you know, need to accept Jesus as their Messiah, as their king, their returning king. Okay, they accept King Saul in, in type as the Antichrist, but it's King David that they really need. He comes after King Saul. And I talked about that earlier. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Okay. Holy place. The rebuilt Jewish temple. Look at the next one. Let them which be in Judea. Judea. No Christians over there in Judea. Jews. There's nothing in there for Jews, you know. Give me a break. Okay. Down here, verse 20. 
But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Neither on the Sabbath day? Well, that's got to be for Christians. You know, we're, we're to keep the Sabbath day, definitely for sure. That's, that's definitely there for Christians. I mean, let me show you here in Romans, the book of uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not or thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Why didn't Paul mention keeping the Sabbath day? When over in Matthew 24 it says that you're to worry about the Sabbath day there. And we can go on and on and on. Mark chapter 13 talks about you'll be persecuted in the synagogues. But why bother? Let's continue here with this book of Kent Hovens. When he selected his 12 disciples, he selected Simon the Canaanite. Okay, trying to say that he was a, a Gentile. He was not a Gentile. Give me a break. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence that all of his hundreds of followers or even that his 12 disciples were all Jews. And there's plenty of evidence that they were not all Jews, especially at the end of his ministry when these passages in question certainly take place. Okay, Ken Hoven, you're right on the brink of going into replacement theology. You're going to start saying that the church has replaced Israel. I mean, you're already basically saying it by saying that the Daniel's 70th week is all about the church and not about Israel. They just get a little blip at the very end after the thing, you know, into the millennial kingdom. Uh, very, very, very dangerous to get into that thing. I mean, just really, really, really bad. But you say, you know, this, this, but it's, it's you know, the, the church, it's the church, it's the church. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, let me see here. That's the verse I'm trying to find here real quickly. Okay. I was thinking Matthew chapter 11, but it's Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, why would he say that if some of the disciples were non-Jews? You ought to be ashamed of yourself falling for this stuff, Dr. Hoven. I mean, you know, if you were, you know, if there were some things that they did to make you start feeling this way, well, then I'm sorry that that had to happen, but you got to abandon this stand. It's very, very bad. Um, again, he comes down here and he says that there's no proof that they were Jews. Yes, there is. I mean, come on. Salvation is of the Jews. Jesus came to his own and his own received him not. I mean, there's so many scriptures. Again, read Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and see how many times Jesus clearly refers to his disciples, not Jews. That is shameful. I mean, that is, that is really, really, really bad. Very bad. Down here he talks about Mark 13, and he talks about in the synagogues. Look what he says. The Jews don't beat the Jews in the synagogues for Jesus' name. What? <laughs> Have you read the book of Acts? You know, where they're preaching in the synagogues and they're getting beaten and thrown in jail by the Jews. What do you mean they don't beat the Jews? You know. <sighs> Down here he says, for the elect's sake, Christians are God's elect. He was on the mount talking to his disciples, not Jews. See, Ken Hoven, you are right on the brink of going into replacement theology. You really, really, really need to be careful about that. Page 175. I think he wants it clear he is talking to his disciples, not Jews. One would have to help in a, or an ulterior motive to, un, to misunderstand that. Some, of course, want to believe in the pre-trib rapture. I do, too. Uh, I, wish it were, I wish it was true, but I can't twist the obvious teaching of the Bible to make it fit my predetermined theology, and you should neither. Since the pre-trib idea started 180 years ago, it has been common for Bible teachers to say these passages apply to Jews and then dismiss the clear warnings, warning they belong to uh, to believers. I'm sorry, fellas, but those patches are not for the Jews. You are treading on thin ice, Dr. Hoven. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3. Man of sin revealed. We are here for that. Again, repeating the same lies over and over again. Uh, hmm. Telling the people good things are coming rather than the truth will cause them to not turn from their evil way 
If you believed you would be here for the tribulation, would that make you examine your life and actions more? Would it make you less likely to sin? Would it make you set your affections on things above and not on the earth? I am convinced we will be here for the tribulation by warning many people. By warning people, maybe I can help them from keep keep them from falling or turn away or turn many to righteousness and win the Daniel 12 3 prize. Join me, please. Oh, don't make me puke. It's so disgusting to see a great man like Ken Hogan falling for this. Good night, you know. If you believe that you were here for the time of Jacob's trouble, what would it do to you? It'd make me very carnal. It'd make me extremely carnal. You know, if I believed I was going to be here for it, good night. You think I'd be wasting my time on camera trying to witness to people? I'd be preparing for the thing, man. Page 178. The idea that Christians will not be here for the tribulation is not found in the Bible and is not what anyone has authority from God to preach. Wrong. And I will continue to preach it, even if it costs me my life. Um... Down here further, it says, could even let Satan speak through them. Uh, I, you know, if I'm, I'm talking about here, you know, pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, I'm letting Satan speak through me. <laughs> I advise caution when teaching about end times, uh, others about end times, or anything about the Bible. I waited nearly 40 years before publishing my views because I wasn't sure. You can ask my wife of 39 and a half years of, or, or my grown children. I don't change my mind easily. I changed it on the pre-trib in 2009 and am convinced what I now teach is right. I would love to be able to tell believers that everything will be fine and we will be raptured out before the tribulation. I cannot be true to the Bible and teach that any longer. Be careful what you teach about God's Word. You will be held accountable. And you will be. Ken Hovind, you'll be held very accountable for believing this lie and teaching it. Get it settled in your hearts that you will be expected to endure to the end. Absolute, total lie, false teaching. Very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Page 182. Even Bible teachers who believe in the pre-trib rapture, they are wrong. See Appendix 4. Teach that the day of the Lord has two parts. They often confuse the day of Christ with the day of the Lord and confuse tribulation with wrath. Big mistake. Uh, no, it's not because, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble is a time of wrath. It begins at the very beginning, as I've been saying. Good night. <sighs> Schofield says, blah, blah, blah. Cited in Rasmussen's book, Post-trib, pre-wrath, rapture. His, see his excellent charts on end times in the back of the dissertation. Keep saying that over and over and over again. But notice there's no page. There's nothing cited there. So I can't even look this up. That's a problem. Quoted in Rasmussen, page 74. Yes, I'm sure. Rasmussen is a real devil. Remember, man does the tribulation, but God does the wrath, and we are not appointed to wrath. <sighs> Page 184, Revelation 6, 1 through 12, tells of the Lamb, Jesus opening six seals. Christians will be here for all six, as we saw in Appendix 4. The opening of the first seal brings false peace and a combining of kingdoms. And uh, who brings the false peace? The Antichrist. Sad. Very, very, very sad. Page 186. One of the main purposes of all this tribulation and wrath is to get more people saved. Even in judgment, God is not willing that any should, or that any perish. Uh, no, it's not. No, it's not. The entire book of Revelation is written primarily to confirm the New Testament to the Jewish people. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what it's for. It's not for, let's get lots of people saved. The majority of people in that time period are going to go to hell. Uh, page 188. These two are probably Enoch and Elijah since they never died and it is appointed, and it is appointed unto men once to die. This is another one of the favorite things. Hebrews 9.27 is used to prove that it can't be Moses and Elijah because Moses died, so how could he come back? Well, Lazarus died and came back and then died again. Okay, there were a lot of men who died, came back, and died again. Jonah died and was resurrected and died again. Okay? And, you know, the two witnesses themselves you know, are going to die and be resurrected. So God can, can you know, Hebrews 9.27 is a general truth, but God can certainly step in and say, okay, supernaturally, no, that guy's not going to die. And, you know, this one's going to die, but he's going to come back and die again. And uh, Moses and Elijah definitely are the ones. Mount of Transfiguration, they're the two that showed up. The book of Micah, the end of the book of Micah, Moses and Elijah are given. 
They are the two witnesses. Again, I've done a lot of studies on that. The next stop is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Here he talks about the ten virgins went forth to meet the bridegroom. Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Matthew chapter 25. The reason I highlighted these is because down here he puts in, you know, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then he quotes Matthew 25, which has nothing to do with the body of Christ. This is about saints from the time of Jacob's trouble. Ten virgins, they go out to meet the bridegroom, not to marry him. They have to buy, you know, the Holy Ghost, essentially, works, you know. Down there it says, chaste virgin, singular. This is the body of Christ down here. This is who Jesus Christ is marrying. These are the guests of the marriage. Virgins. Virgin. Jesus Christ has one bride, not multiple virgins. Okay? Again, the church. It. It. A glorious church. Singular. See, the body of Christ is singular. Up here, this is plural. It's not the same. Ken Hoven is wrong again on that. Page 199. In the 20th century, Israel was brought back to their land. It is especially amazing after the way they were nearly devoured by the sword in Hitler's camps. Well, if you go far enough with this whole post-trib pre-wrath thing there, Dr. Hoven, you're eventually going to be denying that. You'll eventually be a Holocaust denier, replacement theology, the whole nine yards, or whole 666 yards, perhaps I should say it that way. Page 203. After the battle of Armageddon, Satan is cast into the pit for 1,000 years. Well, not according to your chart. It's 997. Jesus uh, just wants us to hold on and, and stay faithful until the end, and he will re reward us with entrance into this time. I don't have to stay faithful to the end to be saved. That's not true. And there he actually shows a picture of this nonsense heretic, uh, Joey Faust, here this the rod will God spare it thing. Half the body of Christ is in hell, half to, half is in on the earth for the millennial kingdom. Ridiculous. Second Timothy two twelve is pretty clear that if we suffer we shall also reign with him. Well what if we don't suffer? What if we are not faithful and fall away into sin as we saw in four B and four D? If we don't get to reign with him, what happens to us? Simple. You just lose rewards. You know, what happens to the Christians that uh, you know are carnal and whatever else. What happens to them? Let's look about it. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12. What he just showed here. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Keep reading. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. But according to Joey Faust, you're going to have the Lord saying, Depart from me, ye cursed and everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. Sending half of his body or part of his body into hell. So Jesus is up there, you know, sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, and he's kind of sweating one day and say, Lord, what's going on? I'm just really hot right now. I'm just really sweating. Why? Well, half of my body's in hell burning right now. Yeah. Joey Faust is a nut. Absolute ridiculous nonsense. Body of Christ burning in hell. Give me a break. Page 213. We're getting close to the end here. You have to endure to the end. After 1,000 years and Satan's final futile rebellion, God calls everyone who has ever lived to come and stand before him. This is the big one, Judgment Day. The Bible has a lot to say about this day, and you and I will be there. No, we will not. Uh, we are not judged at the Great White Throne Judgment. That's the judgment for the lost. All right, There are no Christians at the Great White Throne Judgment, unless you're talking about us standing at the right hand of the Lord, over there with, you know, as the holy angels up there, okay? Uh, there is no such thing as a Christian being judged at that time. Our judgment's already taken place. Page 216. Here we see one of scores of verses that teach us that all we need to do to be saved is believe. God then comes in and changes the heart. 
The sequence is simple. Believe, receive, everlasting life. Get raised up the last day. Uh, 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 you know, uh, why are you believing? What are you believing? You know, I mean, there's, see, you know, starting to head towards this, you know, Jack Hiles, you know, believe and receive, no repentance type of a thing. You, very dangerous. Uh, continuing, page 220. The seven-year period before the rapture, and especially the last three and a half years called the time of great tribulation, will be the ultimate test of our Christianity. Do we really believe the Bible? <laughs> uh, do you really believe the Bible there, Ken Hoven? Uh, you don't rightly divide it. You might believe it, but you don't really, rightly divide it because you've been led astray by false prophets. Okay? But, you know, the church's ultimate trial... Uh, it's, it's kind of funny because, um, you know, the ultimate test of Christianity, right there he says it, but in the catechism, the Roman Catholic catechism, again, I showed it in my one preacher rapture moment, they actually call it the church's ultimate trial. So who is getting to Kent Hoven? Sounds like Jesuits to me. Page 221. I suppose for some hearing that we will be here for the tribulation would be similar to a person hearing the news from the, their, their doctor, you've got three months to live. There needs to be a mental acceptance of the truth. Well, it's not the truth, so why bother? The truth is, we will be here for the seven years, including the last three and a half years of great tribulation, and millions will be called on to die for their faith, just as happened to the Christians in the first few centuries and is happening to many thousands of believers today. <sighs> nonsense. Absolute, total nonsense. I mean, just I could keep refuting it over and over and over again, but... You've been watching the study, you've heard the scriptures, you've seen the proof. Page 222, for 40 years I believed in and taught a preacher of rapture. That is certainly what I wanted to hear and believe. I still wish it were true, but I cannot be true to God's word and teach that any longer. Yes, you can if you rightly divide it. The church was right for the first 1800 years. Absolute lie. And we were duped by a 15-year-old Scottish girl in 1830 into believing something that just ain't so. Uh, yes, it is. And she wasn't the one that taught it. Now look at this. What if God is silent? Don't be ignorant of the fact that God may be silent and not answer our prayers during this time of suffering. Boy, that's, that's reassuring, isn't it? You know? Wherefore comfort one another with these words. God's not going to hear you as he pours out his wrath and judgment on you. This down here really shocked me too. I thought this is sickening. Page 229. While there may be a few theological flaws we could argue about for a while in the book, the shack. I enjoyed reading it four times because it shows us or shows how to be close to Jesus personally. I highly recommend it if you have not read it. Now that right there, uh, Ken Hoven, you're going to answer big time for that. Okay, that is blasphemy. Um, absolute total blasphemy. This book, The Shack, it's about some guy that went out and there was a shack and the, the Godhead was there. And one of them was a you know, in, in Bermuda shorts or something, or swim trunks. Another was, a, I think the Holy Spirit was represented by a, a large, overweight black woman or something. I mean, we're talking blasphemy. You know, there are liberal Bible uh, schools out there that are, that are boycotting and banning the thing. I mean, it's, it's blasphemy. You know, I mean, I don't know what all they did to Ken Hoven in prison, but for him to say he read the shack and it was a blessing and he recommends it, He is in trouble with the Lord, I'll tell you what. And I don't want to see him fall. I don't want to see him getting messed up or whatever else. But he's headed for destruction. Big time. And especially if he hangs out with this crowd of Lone Star 1776. The guy, you know, is one of good friends with James Manning. The guy dresses up like a Catholic cardinal or bishop or whatever. James Manning that, that says that the, the Harlem is where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from. And the black race is the superior race and all this other stuff. James Manning is a wingnut. Okay, the guy's nuts. He's off his rocker. You know, he got out of jail and he's walking through the park and he meets an angel called King Totally Good Joseph, which is playing checkers, you know. And there's an angel and he tells James Manning, you're going to be a great preacher and whatever else. The guy's nuts. And Lone Star 1776, Rudy is his name. And he's coming out, oh, I, you know, he's a good buddy of Ken Hoven now and helping Ken Hoven. They had put Ken Hoven on the, the Alex Jones show, Stephen Anderson, you know. Buddy, buddy with Ken Hoven. See, the devil is trying to destroy Ken Hoven. And he's doing a good job of it. And if you're recommending the shack, I'd say the devil's doing a really good job. 
Page 230. Talking about John or John Wycliffe's thing here in this book. Indeed, those who endure unto the end the same shall be saved, get raptured. That's not what that verse means. But why? It goes into Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. 14. Uh, it goes into that saying, the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached. It's talking about salvation. It's not talking about getting raptured, shall be saved. It's talking about salvation in context. If it is true that only the martyrs get the 1,000-year kingdom, as it sure seems to me. Down here again, Jesus' advice and commands for the tribulation saints endure the end. You know, for people in the time of Jacob's trouble, yeah, you know. Preach the gospel to all nations, Matthew 24, verse 14. Again, that's not the gospel that we preach. We do not preach the gospel of the kingdom. When you see the uh, Antichrist set up his abomination, get away from Jerusalem. <laughs> oh, I thought it was not to Jews. Be patient. He's coming back. Once the treaty is made, you can count the days. No man knoweth the day or the hour. Not according to Ken Hovind. You can count the days. Page 232. Joseph's advice. Save up lots now. By the way, if God guides you to save up for what is coming, don't go on national TV on doomsday preppers and show the world what you have saved up. Duh. Advocating prepping. If God tells you to, if God guides you, if God guides you to start prepping. You know, and, and uh, I know one of you, I think it was uh, Jim Beckwith. Uh, I'll give you a little shout out here, brother, because it was a really good comment. And you said, uh, these preppers cannot make a dime off of people that believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. But people that believe you're going to go into it, well, they can get rich off of you. You know, Jim Baker coming out and saying, selling, you know, 20 year storage life food and all this other stuff. Exactly. That's exactly it. You know, preppers, man, there's, there's a huge market for that stuff. All the survival goodies and everything else, underground bunkers and stuff. And Ken Hoven said, hey, if God's telling you to do that, you know, go ahead. Who's carnal? Who's worldly? Those of us that believe in the pre time of Jacob's trouble catching away are those that believe that you're going to go through the Daniel 70th week. I'll let you answer that question. Page 237. And heal their land. Wouldn't it be great if God saw enough righteous people in your state or city or neighborhood that he would decide to make it one of the places that are partly broken and the Antichrist does not have dictatorial powers? <laughs> what? The Antichrist doesn't have dictatorial powers over some parts in, you know, apparently, I guess, in America. Maybe, you know, in Montana or some place like that. I mean, you know, Patriot Covenant communities, you know. Absolutely nonsense. The Antichrist isn't going to have dictatorial powers in some areas. You know, God can heal your land, you know, in Second Chronicles 7.14 or whatever. God will heal parts of the world where they can be safe pockets of resistance against the Antichrist. What in the world? I mean, read the book of Revelation. He gives, gets power over the whole earth. You know, he, he gets power to take peace from the earth. But there's going to be pockets of survivalist prepper communities. They're going to survive, endure to the end. Page 239. After I got converted to the post-trib pre-wrath position. Yes, he did get converted by a false prophet. I showed in Appendix 4 that the Lord will come to gather his saints after the sun and moon go dark, which happens after the tribulation, which happens seven years after the what treaty is made to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. The day of the Lord starts at the rapture after the sun and moon go dark. Then why did Paul say in a moment in the twinkling of an eye? It's a mystery. Okay, here's the first time Ken Hoven actually mentions 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he doesn't read 51 where it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Typical. Page 242. We were told to expect wars, famines, chaos, pestilences, and plagues, and that we would be persecuted and delivered up by our own families. None of these scriptures at all have one Christian even mentioned in them. Page 243. Jesus told his disciples about all about the tribulation they would have to endure, and none of them ran off to a cabin in the woods and began gathering food and ammunition. They understood full well about the prize offered to those who endure to the end. Then it talks about Hitler's concentration camps, which ironically is uh, that Stephen Anderson 
you know, who's also post-trib pre-wrath, denies. <laughs> Hitler's concentration camps were wonderful. A lot of the Jews that survived had good memories, fond memories of dances and happy times and playing sports. <laughs> oh, woo. You know, yeah, okay. But, you know, look up here. You know, don't run off and get a cabin in the woods and whatever else. You know, don't, you know, even though he just told you a couple pages earlier, if God tells you to prep, then go ahead and prep. Just don't be on doomsday preppers. Uh, page 244. Could Satan have planned all this pre-tribulation rapture hype to make our generation of Christians soft so they will fall away when tribulation because of the word hits them? Peter said the scoffers in the last days would mock the Christians saying, where is the promise of his coming? Again, what happens if they do fall away? The implication is being made that they'll lose their salvation. Uh, you know, could Satan have caused the pre-tribulation rapture uh, or been behind the teaching? Absolutely not. I mean, why on earth would Satan want to inspire a movement that gets people fired up about preaching the gospel? Doesn't make much sense, does it? And he just gets into a lot of charts here at the end. Rasmussen's ridiculous nonsense charts. So that's it. Okay. What are we at here? Three hours and eight minutes. Yes, so oh boy. <laughs> um... This type of a book here, um, for me, just to, to hit a couple points, uh, I would not be doing um, justice, I guess, to cover this issue as it needs to be covered. Um, I am concerned about Dr. Ken Hovind. He has been led astray. Um, I believe firmly that the Jesuits, as well as the military-industrial complex, are very active in trying to cover up the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. I mean, when you think about the, the event that this thing is going to be and what change it's going to make when the body of Christ goes boom and leaves and all of a sudden there's a lot of people left behind that thought they were saved, they weren't truly converted, they were false converts, and, you know, all of a sudden you realize that, you know, a whole bunch of people that left were King James Bible-believing. You know, you might add some new people that, you know, just got newly saved and they're using a new version or something like that. I understand that. I understand. Okay, I have videos on that again. But, you know, we're talking a huge, huge change is going to occur. That's why you see, you know, people being, you know, beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the Word of God. Um, you know, this book is going to become hate literature on a brand new level when the rapture actually happens. And so the Jesuits and the military industrial complex are very active right now raising up people to turn people away from the teaching of a pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. So that when the event actually happens, they'll just say it was a terrorist attack or some kind of a thing like that. Um, you know, whatever they're going to try to use. They do not want the majority of people believing in a quote-unquote pre-trib rapture. They don't want that. That's why there's such emphasis being put. And I believe that's why in prison, I don't know what happened. I can't document what happened to, to Ken Hovind. But I firmly believe that he was, you know, put through some mind control, through some brainwashing by this Rasmussen guy. Um, I see Steven Anderson as a puppet of Rasmussen and possibly even Rosenthal. Uh, th their system is so convoluted. It's so complex. There's no way you're ever going to come to that conclusion just reading the King James Bible as it stands. No way. No way. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. And, and you know, like I said... Marvin Rosenthal, in his book, plainly states that it is a new system of belief and that he is hoping that it catches on in popularity and eventually overtakes everything else. What's that saying? See? And Ken Hovind, too. I didn't show this one thing. I will show this. Um, uh, here he actually has... When is the Lord coming back? Short answer, during the Feast of Trumpets in 2028. And then he gives Proverbs 18, 13. Then he says, okay, and here he gets into all this other stuff. You know, so he's actually predicting dates. Um, he's saying that Matthew 24 is not at all about Jews when it plainly is written to the Jews. He's, he's you know, messing around with the thing of salvation. I mean, we're, Ken Hovind's falling apart. That's why I really have been requesting prayer for him. Uh, I want to see Ken Hovind stay busy answering the atheists, answering the evolutionists. 
Um, if he's going to start going out and spreading this satanic heresy, I'm going to stand against Ken Hoven. And uh, I will take on Ken Hoven. Um, maybe not in what you would call a debate, but I have, I have some questions for him to answer. And um, it's going to show his position is rather ridiculous and does not line up with Scripture uh, for Christians today. So that is going to be it. I'm not going to keep talking here because we are. this was a very, very, very long study. And uh, it, it needed to be done. It's as simple as that. I've been putting this thing off. I heard that he was, had written a book. I know some of the brethren have been after me now for a long time. Brother Brian, could you please answer him? Could you please go over this thing point by point? Well, it's done now. Uh, if I eventually am in contact with Ken Hoven, um, if that happens... Um, he can't say, well, you didn't read my book. I read it, and I refuted it point by point by point. Uh, I showed a lot of scripture in this study. Um, I can't cover it any more thoroughly than I've already done. And uh, the next uh, jobs for me are going to be, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Rosenthal's book, and of course Rasmussen, when, he, when that book comes, I'm going to expose him. Uh, because I think that he's kind of one of the puppet masters, the programmers that, that uh, is behind Steven Anderson. And uh, just the fact that, you know, why wouldn't they interview Rasmussen for this uh, video after the tribulation when Rasmussen was the one who came up with this whole theory? There's some definite deception going on. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. And um, I'm going to keep defending the, the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away. And if you're out there and you're saved, you need to understand that Jesus Christ could come back at any time. And that will purify your life because if you're looking for the Antichrist and the coming New World Order government and all that stuff, well, you have a, you have a time frame between now and the time you meet Jesus Christ face to face. If you believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, pre tajja as I like to call it, if you believe in that, you could be meeting Jesus in the next five minutes. It makes you think. You know, when you're out there at the store and God says, hey, give that person a tractor, put the tract in there, or put a tract over there, or whatever else, witness to this person. What if you meet the Lord in another hour? Or what if you meet Him in another five minutes? You're putting that tract down like this, and the Lord catches you away. Something to think about. It's a purifying hope. It's exciting. And you know, when I say I think the Lord could be coming back soon, how does it make you feel as a Christian? Does it make you feel like kicking back? Say, oh, you know, the Lord's going to come back this year sometime. <sighs> I think I'm just going to take it easy. No. It makes you want to get more zealous for the things of the Lord. Jesus is going to be taking his bride away very soon. Be also ready. Even so, come Lord Jesus.